G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today we're going to run through the final part of my series on materials. This is the third part, and today we're dealing with managing a shared material library and how they work. So previously we've looked at the basics of materials, and we've looked at how to set up some custom materials and have a look at them in Enscape, and today we're going to be looking at managing a library. So uh, what is a shared material library? Uh, it's basically a special Revit file that stores your materials um, outside models, and it can be server hosted, and it can path custom image maps, and it can work between different versions of Revit, Revit as well, as well as between multiple user machines. And it basically acts as like a family library in some regards. So usually when I manage a shared material library, one of the most important parts is to have a good naming convention for your materials and how you sort them. Uh, because not only will it influence how you name and manage materials in the material browser in the project, but also how you manage them within your library by breaking them down by category and also how you manage image maps, uh, which can also be broken down by category. It's good to make everything common and uh, talk to each other at each, each respective level so that people know where to find things. Um, and it also avoids double up in naming as well. So usually a naming convention I recommend is to put uh, your acronym for your company or who you are on the front um, with a separator, then a category, for example, concrete, and then descriptors, uh, as many as you need to describe the material efficiently. Um, you can always put numbers after these words as well, if you know that you're going to have, say, five types of in-situ concrete, because maybe you have a lot of options in your renders for how you want things to look. Um, but usually just descriptors are good enough. And then I'd say just a code on the end, if your material actually has a keynote associated to it. And the reason I think it's good to put that on the end is because between specific projects, you might be using the same material, but maybe it has a different code, depending on how you're scheduling your materials. So it's good to put that on the end so that in most projects this could be common and maybe this is just a bit that the user puts on the end if they need to. Um, so just an example I thought I might show you is actually my own personal library which I'm happy to show you. Um, this is one that I built uh, back when I was doing some, some just some personal experimental work to develop my BIM skills. So basically the shared material library sits at the same level as the AEC library and the Autodesk library. I'm in Revit 2016 at the moment because I haven't actually worked on this for quite a while. So this is the last version I actually worked on my library in. Now I actually work on a company library instead for the company I work for. Um, but you can see here that I broke it down by category. So these are all just category folders and each one contains respective materials that relate to that category. So you can see I'm under masonry, I've got all my brickwork and block work. Um, under metal, I've got all sorts of things that relate to metal. Lots of paint colors, uh, concrete's quite exhaustive, lots of, lots of different materials. And while you're in the shared library, you can look at the material, but you can't edit it because it basically it's a storage point for materials, but it will give you a thumbnail display of the material at least and how it looks. And it should path them from where they're located on, um, on your server or your library, uh, depending on the computer or the server that you're working on. So it's good to make sure that whatever maps you use in your library, uh, essentially stored somewhere that everyone has access to as a path. Um, so that's pretty much how I set up my library. And similarly, I set up my image maps in a similar way. So each of my categories has a respective folder for the image maps that they use. So for example, concrete, all my concrete maps are in a concrete folder. So it's important to keep that structure uniform so people know how to find things and use things for the right purposes. Uh, but anyway, that's just an example of how you can do it. But what we're going to do is actually demonstrate how you can set up your material library from scratch um, and how you can manage it as well. So we've got a demonstration model here that we worked on in our last tutorial where we've made some custom materials. So let's say that we want to actually make these part of our company standard um, or we want to use them on another project and we need to migrate them. What we do is we go to our material browser and we'll just minimize the AEC library. So this is the project's material library. Um, we can't obviously access this from other projects or a server-based environment. So what you do is open this icon here and you go create new library and it's going to prompt you to save a, an ADSK LIB file, which is basically an Autodesk library file. Usually you want to put it somewhere where your maps are on your server or wherever you're working from and you can give it any name you want. The name can be changed, but you'll need to repath your library if it does get changed. So let's say for now, we'll just call it ABE shared mats. And it will create this folder here. But what this folder actually represents is that file. So if I go to demo, uh, I think it's under mats. Yes, so that, that is the file that we're working in right now. You can see at the moment it's quite light. It's only four kilobytes. Um, even if you add materials to it, it shouldn't grow that much because um, typically it's pathing the maps. It's important to that before you start working too heavily on this file, you go to options, rendering, and add the location of those maps. That way 
your library and your computer can source those maps and find the path for them as well. Sorry, my cat's meowing a bit there. So if I go to materials and I go back to this library, what I can do is start moving materials into that library. And it's just as simple as dragging and dropping really. Um, you can drag onto and then click and now I'm in my library at this point. But what you might want to do is categorize your materials instead. So we've got a bunch of brick materials here, a carpet, chain mesh, concrete, roof, tiles, timber, etc. Let's say we just make a brick group and we'll just call this brick. And let's say we're going to come back to this later and go, okay, we've got a brick group. Okay. But what actually happens is if nothing's in that category folder, typically that category folder won't actually persist. What you need to do is actually put things in it quite, quite early. So as soon as you make it, drag and drop materials into it. And this is basically the library overall, but this is the filtered version of the library. So if I take some other materials, drag and drop them. So let's make cut. And let's say, let's just make a concrete folder and drag in our concrete. So if I select overall, these are all my materials, but if I go brick, you can see it filters it. So it makes it really easy to find materials that you need by category. So let's just make like one or two other categories. We'll just say roof. Drag in, uh, let's say tiles and timber. And typically a miscellaneous one for the things that don't really belong to a particular group are probably, probably the right sort of categories to have. Um, if you're looking for a good set of categories to go with, um, when in doubt, I recommend that you use the Categories as defined in the classes of materials. That's a good starting point If you're not sure where to go, you may not need every single one like obviously system probably doesn't really matter Unless you want to keep a copy of all the system materials um, when I say system That's where I mean things like default uh, default mass default wall things that you don't actually use but Autodesk has to keep a copy of um, But if you want a good reference as well, um, the way I've categorized them here isn't too bad. So all these categories you can see here are pretty much covering the, the trades either by Revit system or by finish type. So for example, carpet is a floor finish type, but there's a lot of different floor types. So I've separated those out, but I just have one for ceilings, for example, because there's not that many ceiling finishes you can have or, or need. Um, but then I have things like gas, glass, liquid. So some of them are based on state because obviously liquid, you only probably have water and maybe a hand gel for healthcare projects, um, just as, as an example. Um, so lots of different options there, um, and then just ones that I call templates, so things like analytical materials that just don't really, don't, almost don't need to be in the shared material library, but I just keep them there for safekeeping, because you never know if someone on a job is going to delete that material by accident. So they're a way to sort of keep a, I guess, a safe version of all your materials as well. And you can rename those categories with no issues coming of it. And let's say I'm another user, and I want to access that library. Um, all I have to do is just go open existing library and on my server I'll navigate to that file and there we are. I have access to those materials now. So let's say that I'm, I don't have any of these materials in my project anymore. They're all gone. So obviously I need those materials. So what I can do is just click this and there's this little arrow here that basically says add material to document. So I can add that and now this material is available and it brings its material assets with it as well. The issue, see, it's got a bracket with a one after it. So what happened here is this asset already existed in the project. What materials will do is if the asset's already there, they'll make a copy of themselves sometimes. So what you'll need to do instead is actually purge out those assets before you reload other ones in. If it does find an overwrite candidate, so a material with the same name, it will allow it to update but keep the same asset. That's the exception to the rule that I found. Um, so now if they're gone and I load in that material, it should bring in its asset with a one. There you go. So that's the standard asset. It brings all the images, all the settings. Um, it brings hatch patterns only if the hatch pattern exists in the project. So if I was going to take something such as my, I think my roof had a shingles material on it or a shingles pattern. If that doesn't exist in my project, you'll find that it might actually not come in at all. So. Uh, I've just got to find the material. That's the, the hard part. Shingles. I remember roughly what it looked like, but I can't see the actual material itself. I might just purge it out. I'll just do a full purge until it's gone. So I think that was a custom that was a custom pattern file that I loaded. So if it doesn't exist in the project, it won't come in either. 
So if I take this one here, it may actually be there. I'll just double check again. There it is. So, so this didn't exist in my project. It wasn't part of my template that all my projects are derived from, which is a common issue. Um, it won't bring its hatch pattern in either. So that can be a bit of a challenge. So you do need to make sure that your company template or your personal template are built with as many fill patterns as possible and, and pattern definitions in order to have them ready for the material to come in and receive. So for example, the brick patterns are still here. So when it comes in, it knows to have the these patterns by default. So just be careful with that. Um, but otherwise that's really it. And let's say we've modified our material and you know, we, we like we like maybe a different sort of color and we're experimenting with some funny blue material for some strange reason. All you have to do to update the material is click and drag and it prompts you to replace or keep both. And in this case, you just replace it. And you can see it's updated in the material as well. So be mindful that when that happens, it won't go and update the material everywhere in your company in all your models that are connected to that library. It's a bit like a family. You do need to actually uh, reload the material in order for it to understand what should happen to it. So likewise, if I, let's say I, I change this one to type one. Uh, sorry, I'll just go back. Actually, that's probably better because now I can get the old material. So I'm just going to load in type one, but rename it to type two, just to make it a, a supersede candidate for this other one. So let's say I load that in, um, then it prompts me to replace the material because it knows that it's different and then it's up to date. So that would be what your users would have to do in order to update changes to your material library. So it's good to experiment with your library as much as possible before you roll it out to your company or to other people that you work with. Um, but that's that's pretty much all there is to material libraries um, and if you remove the library there's no harm done um, it still exists as a file um, but as materials get added to it it will grow in file size um, so just be mindful of the size of your image maps and how many materials you store in it but it's good to just have one for your company or for you ideally and then if you have special libraries for other projects sure but it's good to have that, that starting point. And ideally your templates should contain the materials that your library contains as well for consistency. So ideally this is just really there for people that want to load in specialized materials for certain scenarios. And then your template should probably have what you need uh, as a starting point. Um, but that's really all there is to shared material libraries, but they're really, really helpful to have. And I think every company should have at least one main material library. If they, if they try to use the Autodesk library, there's probably a lot of things they're missing out on such as the coding system and also high quality materials. So um, consider that. Uh, but that's pretty much all there was for today. It was a really quick tutorial, uh, but really essential to the whole process. If there's any other topics you'd like covered on materials, uh, feel free to leave uh, comments or suggestions down below. I will cover some advanced uh, tutorials on rendering later on. Um, but for now, that's, I guess, the, the material series finished. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll be here for the next one. Uh, if you like what you're seeing, feel free to follow and subscribe. And um, thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.